Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our presentation today of the Canadian Chamber's uh, Q3 analysis uh, of the Canadian Survey on Business Conditions. I'm Patrick Gill, the Senior Director of Tax and Financial Policy at the Canadian Chamber, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our three presenters today. Uh, starting off will be Stephen Tapp, the Canadian Chamber's new Chief Economist, uh, followed by uh, two representatives from Deloitte, Will Cornelison, who is partner, Federal Financial Services Leader at Deloitte, as well as Jean Devin, Senior Manager of Monitor Deloitte. Uh, just to emphasize this, uh, this presentation is being recorded so that we can uh, take your feedback and, and questions and incorporate into our future analysis and questionnaire consideration for the Canadian Survey on Business Conditions. Uh, this is meant to be a dialogue. And so as we go through the presentation, do not hesitate to put up your hand uh, uh, through the uh, raise hand function on the Zoom screen below uh, to, to ask your questions uh, live to, to the presenters. Thank you very much. And I, I turn it over now to Stephen. Thank you very much, Patrick. All right, so yeah, my name is Stephen Tapp. I'm uh, the new Chief Economist here at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this session. What I thought I'd do is just uh, open up with just a few minutes of a uh, more high-level macro context to give you some sense of uh, the survey was, was in the field in July and August to give you some sense of what was happening in the economy at that time and uh, to preview some of the main themes that Deloitte will go through uh, once I'm done. So, um, let me start with an origin story, just to, for those of you who are new to the survey, just to give you a sense of uh, when this started out. So back in uh, the pandemic began in uh, more or less February or March of, of last year, uh, this really emphasized the need for timely access to real-time data for understanding business conditions in Canada. And so the chamber um, understood this gap and quick, quickly partnered with StatsCan to design uh, the survey methodology and, and figure out how to get this in the field quickly. We have done six uh, surveys now. So this has been done on a quarterly basis since uh, April, 2020. And one of the main benefits, so there's a relatively small sample size since we, be, we, since we started out the pandemic, but one of the main benefits is a, a very large sample size. So the respondents here, you have over 15,000 Canadian companies responding to the survey. And what that allows us to do is to, to really drill down by industry, uh, looking across different firm sizes and, and getting into the CMA understanding ownership and diversity inclusion elements as well as international business practices. So it's, it's a really um, great survey. We've got some good results so far. We see a lot of potential to grow this and do more with it in the future. Uh, let me preview some of the main findings that we're going to go through in a bit more detail as we go. But the, the first and, and um, highest level finding in terms of the forward looking expectations aspect of the survey is that we see business optimism in Canada increasing, uh, looking ahead at the three month and, and 12 month ahead basis. However, as I mentioned, going into the fourth wave, as this was being conducted, uh, there's still an, an elevated level of uncertainty among business in terms of not being uh, aware of or clear on what the next steps will be for government regulations and, and economic strength going forward. Second main point, uh, as we had seen early in the pandemic, a big hit to overall demand conditions as people were essentially locked in their homes and, and not out shopping, uh, we opened up progressively over time. The shift in the economy in, in uh, Canada has really moved from businesses more to being concerned about not enough demand now to being how do we get supply and, and uh, be able to bring supply online to meet demand that is there now. So we've seen this very clear shift that's continued over several surveys. Uh, we're going to talk about the rise of remote work, which has done a couple of things. Given the, the labor shortages, given uh, increased input costs and other supply concerns and, uh, that, that companies have had, they have turned to, uh, to fill some labor shortages through online platforms and remote work, which has been uh, enabled uh, and, and accelerated through COVID. Uh, so we see gig economy opportunities, which we'll talk about as well uh, with people working from home and remotely a lot more. There has been a, a big decline in terms of office real estate demand, and we've seen a pretty big variation across different CMAs, which the survey lets us get into, uh, which is, I guess, interesting. Last point would look at environmental practices. We've seen a lot of companies in Canada um, understanding the need to become more environmentally sustainable and friendly in their practices, helping the bottom line and helping the environment. Uh, but we do see some challenges that are coming forward in terms of price sensitivities or uh, lack of, of standardization of, of uh, metrics across companies. And so those are some of the things that we'll be talking about as we go. Uh, let me show you a couple of charts there before we get into it, um, just to set the context again on the the COVID cases and, and the, the rates uh, that we had during the survey, I've shaded that in gray there. So you can see 
we did have some opening up, uh, particularly across the prairies and removal of restrictions uh, early in July in the survey. There was um, uh, a push and some momentum in the economy, but then as we got in, closer into, into August, as the survey is being conducted, uh, variants increasing uh, the Delta variant across other economies and, and uh, those concerns coming into Canada. So that, that's uh, just, just noting to pick that up in terms of the overall context. Um, we talked about supply considerations and rising input costs have been a big concern for Canadian business. Uh, plotting a couple of uh, price indices here from the OECD. We know oil prices fell quite heavily early on, but have come back quickly and transportation, gasoline, other costs have been arising for companies. Uh, other input costs from uh, metals to minerals, et cetera. Those have been at elevated levels. But you see in red, the chart that's really uh, jumping off on the y-axis there is shipping costs, which are up almost fivefold relative to pre-pandemic levels. So uh, container shortages, and we've seen some uh, issues in terms of semiconductors and, and uh, the rest. So we'll talk about supply chains a little bit. There's some pressure on global supply chains. Uh, we've looked at purchasing managers indices. And again, on the demand side, orders are good. So looking across some of the main supply chain hubs uh, through Europe, North America, and even into Asia. Um, a line above 50 here is, is an increase in growth uh, on a monthly basis. So we've seen a lot of growth, a lot of demand in, in uh, orders across these main supply chain hubs. But again, the issue has been um, inventories are falling. So demand is high, but it's hard to keep some things um, on hand to meet that demand. So that's something that we've seen in, in the global economy. Uh, the, I, I mentioned the, uh, a semiconductor shortage, uh, there are estimates that about 8 million uh, cars will not be produced this year as a result, uh, that otherwise would have been as a result of these um, in, impacting smartphones and the rest. So that's happening on the supply chain side. And then as we mentioned, uh, the work from home that most people are doing now, uh, that's really hit office vacancy rates. So in Canada, you need to go back to the uh, early 1990s recession until we had a vacancy rate that was this high. So about 25 years ago, uh, we're now at about 15% or higher on a national level, but again, with, with quite a lot of variation across CMAs as we'll discuss. So um, as those of you know, I just, uh, I, I'm new uh, as the chief economist here. So if people need my uh, contact info, I've got a new um, email address there, stop at chamber.ca if you need to get a hold of me. And I'm happy to, uh, that you've joined us today. I wanna to turn it the floor back over now to, to Will and Jean to discuss, uh, have Deloitte discuss uh, their analysis of the survey. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you, Stephen. And as we queue up the, the slides for the, the deeper dive into the survey. I think it's worth just saying that, um, you know, for those of you that have joined us before, uh, this is a great survey in the sense that it allows us to track some trends quarter over quarter to see what the changes are, but then also to see what are the new things that are coming up um, in, in, in different quarters. And so um, Stephen went through some of the, the overall findings that we had from for, for this year. We, we generally look at um, how optimistic companies are quarter over qu quarter and what level of uncertainty they have. So they are optimistic, but, but, but uncertain. So there's, there's something there. Um, and, you know, our second insight, I think would be around as, as Stephen was saying, the supply related challenges, but also um, as there's been a resurgence in demand, obviously revenues have increased for companies and that's also increased their ability to take on additional debt. Um, Many businesses are addressing workforce issues, um, both in terms of capacity and capability, and they are looking for other ways of, of filling up those capacity and cap capability challenges. Um, the environmental practices one is a very interesting finding that we've asked businesses around how they're focused on environmental practices and going green. And despite the pandemic, there's still a lot of interest in that, but there are also some barriers to adoption there. And then lastly, um, as Stephen alluded to just now, with the more telework is, is what's in many ways driving the decrease in office space occupancy. So we're going to go through each of these in more detail. Uh, Jean and I are going to just uh, elaborate on a few of them and, and show you some of the, the data um, that helps support these findings. So if we go to the next slide, um, when we look at businesses in terms of how optimistic they are, um, you'll see in, in this, uh, on, on this slide, on the top left-hand side, we look at a quarter over quarter, what are the, some of the indicators that would indicate how their business is going? Is demand there? What, what are their sales like? What is, how are they able to sustain prices? Um, are they increasing the number of employees? 
And what we see here quarter over quarter is that on all of those fronts, businesses uh, are more optimistic because all of those different, the different uh, business drivers are going up. In addition, we're seeing that also coming through in terms of the bottom line. So when we look quarter over quarter and we look at whether things are gonna increase um, uh, in, in, the, in the future, businesses are reporting that they're expecting their operating income to in increase and their expenses, but also their profitability. So obviously the expenses you know, grow with the income, but it's good that they're growing at the same time. So the profitability is, is growing as well. And then when we look at um, how are they actually feeling, this is where there's some really interesting um, differences uh, between some of the other quarters. For those of you who have joined us before, you'll recall that finance and insurance as, a, as an industry was always more optimistic. They were impacted, but they're overall more, more optimistic. And they continue to be one of the more optimistic industries. And in fact, in fact, they've some of the optimism has declined, but they're still in the, in the, in the, in the top most um, optimistic industry. And then the other good news I think here is the industries around arts, entertainment, information and cultural industries. I mean, these were sectors of the economy that were really adversely impacted, especially the beginning part of the, the pandemic. And I think it's great to see that in Q3 of this year, um, we saw much more optimism coming from those sectors. So really significant increases in optimism and the fact that they're now in the, one, one of the, in the top um, most optimistic industries. Transportation, uh, mining, oil and gas, um, part of the, the, the less optimistic industries. Um, and then interestingly, accommodation and food services has perennially been you know, less optimistic and continues to be adversely impacted. I think just so many uncertainties around how, that, how those businesses go forward with everything like vaccine passports and, and other regulations that they're, they're trying to, to, to maneuver around. So overall, a, good, a great story there, but still with a few caveats. And again, I think when we look, the other question we ask is um, to businesses is, how long can they continue to operate at the current level before having to consider either um, laying off staff or considering closure? And while you'll see that in terms of the thinking about the time around that, we've seen an uptick in the uncertainty uh, around that. So I think that is showing that this continues to be a dynamic situation um, and businesses continue to have other questions. Maybe it's not the same thing as driving the uncertainty, but they continue to have other questions that, that make them wonder around what the future looks like. So that's the deep dive on the first uh, insight and I'll pass it over to Jean now. Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'll, uh, I'll just say that uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to use the uh, discussion feature, uh, uh, like chat feature on the uh, uh, on Zoom, or to raise your hand and we'll make sure to address those as we go through the, uh, through the description of the, um, of the analysis. Now, moving to the next slide, uh, for those of you who were there uh, for the previous release of the data, you might recall that we were focusing on the growing concern around the rising cost of input and what measures Canadian businesses were taking to cope with that, uh, with that challenge. One of the main being increasing the prices for the, end, uh, uh, for the end customers. So this time with a new set of data and recurring questions that are being asked by Statistics Canada on the topic of demand and supply related challenges, we were able to confirm that the, there is an increase in demand across all industries resulting from reopening the economy. However, that has given rise to uh, lots of supply related challenges. And this is what the graph on the uh, top left clearly shows. So what you see on that graph uh, with those two lines on the dark blue line, it's the frequency at which Canadian businesses are telling us that their main obstacle for, uh, uh, for their businesses are supply related whether it's rising cost of input, recruiting and retaining skilled labor, or the shortage of labor forces. Then on the light blue line, what you see is really like around uh, the demand related obstacles. So frequency at which Canadian businesses are telling us that the main obstacle for their businesses are driven by demand obstacle, whether it's a fluctuation or insufficient consumer demand, attracting or retaining con uh, consumer. What's What's quite telling on that graph 
while not being that surprising, uh, I'll admit, is that over time, uh, demand-related challenges are less and less important. And the big issue lies with supply now. Um, how to cope with increased demand, how to cope with supply chain disruption that Stephen was just mentioning. These are the points that Canadian businesses are telling us right now. And in a minute, I'll go in a bit more detail uh, uh, on, that, uh, on that graph and the underlying data by looking at something a bit more, even more interesting when you look at the industry by industry nuances or differences. But continuing on the topic of, uh, uh, of supply related challenges, and looking now at the bottom left portion of the screen, it's worth noting that uh, the most frequently cited obstacles are obviously supply-related challenges. Almost 40% of businesses are telling us that they're facing uh, uh, rising costs of input. And this is the top, like the number one challenge that they are facing to operate their business. And a third are uh, facing challenges around workforce and labor, whether it's this is to recruit skilled employees, whether it's a shortage facing shortage of labor forces, also retaining skilled employees. So the labor market is definitely quite, uh, quite tight right now. And after a spike of unemployment uh, during the pandemic, uh, there's been like a significant like uh, 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 reduction, um, almost back to pre pandemic level. But the other side of the story that is quite interesting as well, and where we've seen like lots of changes uh, since the previous set of data, so the previous two quarters, uh, it touches the financing. Um, so more than half Canadian businesses told us that they would be able to uh, uh, take on more debt. And I'm looking at the top right corner of the screen. So more than half of Canadian businesses told us that they would be able to take on more debt. So it's a significant change from that downward trend that we were uh, uh, um, experiencing over the past two quarters so from 37 to 23. 23% uh, uh, in Q2 2021 were telling us, I'm not able to take on more debt. Now it's up to 55%, uh, so a huge jump. And the key reason for that imp like important change are actually illustrated uh, in, the, uh, um, in the graph the, uh, below that one, so bottom right uh, portion of the screen, where we do see a decrease in every single indicators uh, uh, that we are tracking here. So less businesses are telling us uh, that they have lack of confidence in future sale. Less businesses are having cash flow challenges and less also feel that uh, their request for additional debt would actually be turned down. Before posing on, 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 that, uh, on that theme, I wanted to go to the next slide. Uh, uh, to share some industry specific views on supply versus demand related challenges that Canadian businesses are currently experiencing. And when we drill down in the data, like so that same graph of demand and supply that we were showing on the previous screen, uh, uh, but when we drill down in that data, what I do find particularly interesting is that uh, uh, not every industry are actually experiencing the same shift from demand to supply related challenges. So in this graph, you have four quadrants split by on the vertical axis, uh, grouping of industries that face either high or low uh, supply related obstacle. And on the horizontal axis, you see a grouping of industries that are facing high or low uh, 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 demand related obstacles. So starting with the top uh, uh, right quadrants, i.e. industries that are facing that have the highest supply and demand related obstacle, namely accommodation, food services, manufacturing, retail trade. So those are industries that are facing higher levels of supply related obstacles, despite prolonged issue with, uh, uh, with demand. So they are being impacting on both the supply uh, side of things from a disruption perspective and on the demand with the demand that is still uh, uh, not to the pre-pandemic uh, uh, level. On the top left side, you'll notice uh, uh, on the contrary that to those, to those industries that some others, namely agriculture, construction, wholesale trail, actually facing high level, of, uh, high level of demand, so less challenges on the demand side of things, 
but they still have uh, are facing structural issues given the, uh, the, the, the they're impacted by supply chain challenges and supply related uh, obstacles. And all of the industries, those, those six industries that I've just listed, so the one on the top, uh, uh, the top portion of that, uh, of that quadrant, it, they're all mostly selling goods, and uh, uh, it, what appears like well, like it it seems to appear that they are like the the industries that are selling goods are more likely uh, to actually face those supply related obstacles than the one selling services, which is largely the one at the bottom uh, uh, part of that uh, uh, of that quadrants. Then least impacted uh, industries, as we were discussing before, like on the uh, on the level of optimism. So it's finance and insurance, real estate, transportation, and and uh, and industry. So those are the ones that have uh, uh, that are the least impacted in terms of uh, both supply and demand uh, related uh, related obstacle. I know this was lots of uh, information. Maybe I'll I'll see if uh, anyone in the audience has uh, any questions or. If uh, Will or Stephen would like to uh, add anything before we move to uh, the next theme. Everybody being shy in the audience? We can move to the next uh, uh, the next theme, then don't hesitate to come back to that data. I know it's going to be available also offline on the chamber of uh, the chamber's website as well. Uh, so the next theme that we've uh, and, and real like um, this uh, this new set new iteration of the uh, quarterly data of that survey is around the labor market. So what we observe is that businesses across industries are addressing workforce capacity and capability challenges via yeah, gig workers, freelancer and contractors enabled by like third party platforms. So on the left part of the screen, you'll see that on average, and I'm looking at the middle row, on average, like 21% of, uh, uh, of businesses across all industries have outsourced tasks project or contracts uh, to freelancer or contractors uh, over the past 12 months. And some industries like the ICT industry, arts, entertainment, and manufacturing are the one most likely to do so, most likely to outsource up to 36% in the information and cultural and industry uh, uh, being likely to, to outsource tasks to a freelancer, gig workers, or contractors. On the other hand, Industries like finance or businesses within the finance and insurance, transportation and warehousing or agricultural industry are the least likely to do, uh, to do so. I'd say that the most interesting data points actually sits in the, uh, uh, the, the right portion of the, of the screen within that heat map. Um, and just the key to read that heat map uh, in, a, in a nutshell is that the darker the cell is means that there's a higher number of businesses within particular uh, industry uh, that are using third-party like platform tools to actually outsource like uh, one or certain uh, certain activities. Analyzing that uh, that heat map and that table on the right portion of the screen, we observe that six industries, and I'm looking at the at the cells that are highlighted in uh, bright yellow. So six industries actually stood out in the adoption of uh, third-party digital tools to outsource. Accommodation, food services, arts and entertainment, retail trail, scientific services, finance and insurance, and the ICT industry. So those are the industries that are more likely to use third-party digital tools to outsource. Now, if you look at the accommodation and food services, it's way uh, uh, in front of all the other industries in terms of adoption. And the reason is, uh, uh, due to something that we all know very well since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, and all those like delivery driving uh, apps that exist. And you can see that 86% of the services that are outsourced by these industries are actually within the delivery driving category. Now, looking a bit more at the types of activities that are, uh, that are outsourced, so the, the, all the cells that are highlighted in red, uh, it's, uh, uh, you, you'll notice that the darker cells are really into for our services or activities like 
accounting, legal services, website soft or software development, or audio and visual production. So tasks that we could categorize in a like these are like technical or specialized services compared to the last three columns that are more like including the general labors. Uh, so what what it tells us is that the, the, the use of those tools to outsource is generally targeted to very specific and technical activities and not to replace uh, 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 general labor or the traditional employment model. So that, that's, that really to me tells that this is, these are means that are used to address, to obtain quick additional capacity and address those temporary obstacles that businesses are facing on the supply side of things around re retaining like employees, recruiting skilled labor. And so that's, those would be like the key, um, key uh, uh, insights that we have on the use of uh, uh, platforms to outsource some, uh, outsource some of the activities to big workers or freelancers. Yeah, Joe, the only thing I'll, I'll add just on this slide is looking through some of the more detailed uh, data tables we've got here, it does look like there's a difference across uh, age of firms. So a lot of the newer firms, if you're in the first couple of years of business, you're, you're able to kind of leapfrog over or adopt uh, new online technologies right off the bat. You're not uh, stuck with legacy 20 year old systems and, and trying to find new platform providers or change your, your practices around. We've seen uh, a lot of um, business growth or resilience, but uh, Definitely being, being a young firm is uh, clearly seems to be an advantage in the survey. Thanks, Stephen. I'll pass it over to uh, Will to uh, walk us through some of the uh, interesting net new findings around ESG practices and challenges. Thanks, John. Um, so I, I think it's been really interesting that throughout this pandemic that there's still been a continued focus on environmental practices and sustainability and the general greening of, of Canadian businesses. Um, the, the survey shows that the majority of Canadian businesses either have a plan to implement a green practice or already have. So they already have programs underway. And there are a number of different things that they're, they're undertaking. You'll see here on the visual, sustainable resource management, green product development and procurement, governance, and organizational culture initiatives. Um, and then of course, uh, a key one is energy transition and decarbonization. And then finally, the measurement tracking and reporting of all of, all of those things. And so I think it's really interesting when you look at that, even within those categories there, you can see there on the, with the, the graph uh, to the right of that, the, the percentages of businesses sort of doing things within those categories. So some of the easy things are definitely quite popular, like reducing waste. I say re easy, relatively easy. Um, reducing waste, reducing energy and water consumption in the sustainable resource management category. I think it's um, really interesting what we're seeing on green product development. Um, you know, there's, there's more interest in that. And I will just sh share that, you know, at Deloitte, we're definitely seeing a lot of our clients think about, um, about the, this, this category more today. Um, and then the third category where you see the governance piece, I think in, in general, companies are starting to sort of bring about those, those changes in their organizational uh, culture. Um, some of those other ones in terms of energy transition and decarbonization, again, harder types of things to do. And some of the tracking is still reporting to be, uh, um, is proving to be a little bit elusive in terms of really understanding uh, the footprint and then more broadly, the, the footprint that the businesses are embedded in. And so those continue to be challenging areas for green practice, but still many businesses engaged in all of these different categories. Now, having said that, we've also asked um, the businesses, what's, what are the barriers to adopting green practices further? And I think you'll see that there's a general trend across all, companies of all sizes that they do see some barriers. Um, the first one is around clients not willing to pay a higher price. And so it's interesting that often some of these practices come at a cost and those costs have to be passed on to clients um, in order to continue to, uh, in order for, for the business to be sustainable. The other piece associated with that is just not having the financial resources. So um, because this is such a new domain, 
Uh, many businesses just simply don't have the financial resources to figure out how to configure the business um, or even to invest in the capabilities necessary um, to, to, make, to make those green initi initiatives a reality. And then I think finally, interestingly, um, there's a relatively small percentage of the businesses have said, well, COVID has actually delayed the plans for green projects. So as I mentioned earlier, still the businesses that are doing this are still moving forward, but there are, is a small percentage that have delayed those projects. And I think here there's an interesting um, delineation between the larger companies, which um, in some ways have had to sort of fulfill a broader range of, of activities to react to COVID. So we see a slightly higher percentage of, of those large businesses um, reporting that COVID has delayed the, the plans for the green projects. So overall, I think a good story, but um, not without some, without some challenges. And I'll just pause there to see if there are any, any other thoughts or questions. Okay. In the chat window, we got anything? No? Uh, I, I agree with you, Will, just in terms of the, the differentiation among large and small firms, we have seen a, a lot more take up in some industries, um, including, you know, mining resources, finance and insurance, where we have global standards being set, or at least the market and uh, venture capital, people looking to, to raise capital markets have, have faced scrutiny in terms of measuring their, uh, their environmental footprint. So we have seen some sectors moving a lot quicker than others, and, and the differentiation along firm size, as you say, the big firms have the capital, they may have a specialized ESG unit, uh, a firm that has five or 10 people, unlikely to be able to have either the resources, the time, the, the energy and attention to get into it. So um, the, the bottom line that you had there on, on measurement and tracking, I think some of the things that we had on the policy side was really looking for government to take some leadership in terms of standardizing uh, some of the ESG metrics and what those are and business following from there as, as opposed to moving off in a lot of different directions. Um, with people ad hoc measurement that cannot be compared across sectors or across uh, different different uh, jurisdictions. So, great. Well, with that, I will pass it over to Jean for our final insight. Thank you. And the, the the last topic will definitely, I believe, be of interest to all of us who are uh, slowly returning back to uh, to the office. In certain cases, are also planning what we at Lloyd we would call the next normal. And as what what we see is that uh, as the pandemic has progressed, some industry are have become more willing to telework. And as a result, uh, Stephen was mentioning it in, in his uh, introduction, there will be an anticipated decrease in office space occupancy. So now. To illustrate that phenomenon, we looked at two variables and broke it down by industry. And uh, I know it's a busy chart, so I'll uh, try to uh, uh, explain like what's the reading key for everyone. The like when you look at that bubble chart on the left, the vertical axis is really the percent of business for a particular industries that are anticipating a reduction in office space. So the higher you are, the higher, the more likely you are to actually reduce your office space in the office space in the near future. Then now on the on the horizontal axis, it is the increase between before and after the pandemic of the number of businesses with twenty percent of more or more of their workforce that is uh, that is remote. So concretely, if you take the finance and insurance bubble, like uh, on the, 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 the far right uh, side of the, the graph, um, it, uh, it means that, that like the, for, for that sector, the number of businesses in that sector who have 20% of their workforce working remotely has increased by almost 25% between before and after the, uh, the pandemic. And then lastly, the size of, the, uh, of each of those bubbles is actually the percent of business within a given industry for which at least 20% of their workforce will work permanently remotely in the future. So if we, take, if we look at the first one, like that largest, largest bubble, like the, uh, uh, the ICT information and cultural industry, uh, they are the more likely to have 20% or more of their, uh, of their workforce working permanently remotely uh, post pandemic. And they're also the most likely to actually reduce their office location. They are the highest on the graph. So in terms of anticipation of the reduction in the office space, information and cultural industry 
are the more likely to, uh, uh, to reduce their, uh, their office spaces. Then given they started from a lower baseline compared to other white collar industry, uh, the finance and insurance sector saw the largest shift from, uh, uh, from office work to working remotely, increasing from 13 to 36% in that uh, later situation of the, of the survey. So they're the one that have seen that largest increase in what we could call change in behavior uh, uh, over the pandemic, uh, the pandemic time. Then lastly, the, the other industries, and I guess that's kind of predictable, but the agriculture, mining and oil, oil and gas, the uh, transportation and warehousing, so the lightest shift between the pre to after the pandemic uh, uh, with, um, but, but still you see that 10 to 15% of uh, businesses, so I'm looking at the bottom left portion of that uh, uh, of the graph. Still, 10 to 15 percent uh, plan to reduce their uh, their office sizes, like in the near uh, in the near future. Now, the other quite interesting data points was and surprising, I have to say, data points was when we look at the data on the uh, metropolitan like metropolitan area basis. So. Uh, we, we were surprised, I have to admit, by the large disparity that you have in anticipated office space shrinkage between each of the largest Canadian metropolitan areas. So what we learned is that businesses located in Toronto are actually much more likely, 24% of them, to shrink their office uh, location because their workforce is working uh, uh, is teleworking compared to Montreal, where uh, this number is only 7%. So a huge disparity that could be tied to multiple factors, the price of the real estate or rental, the industry mix of, uh, of the city. So that's definitely gonna be a, a, a key trend that we'll continue to monitor uh, in the future so that we can report if there are like any changes uh, over time on that, uh, on that specific topic. So those were like the final insights that we wanted to share with, uh, uh, with you today. And I'll open everyone, like if you have question on this one or any of the other like uh, topic, uh, or would like to know if specific data sets is available, but happy to take that on now. I've got a question uh, to kick things off, hopefully sp uh, spur some things from our audience today. So uh, of the different uh, insights that we generate today, is there one specific insight uh, you would like to be able to uh, double click on in the future to go a little bit deeper, either on input costs, teleworking, or ESG? I think like the on the the ESG front like would be a, a would be one that is like top of mind for um, many of the uh, the businesses we are working with. So I think this one could be interesting to uh, see maybe one level uh, one level deeper in terms of the type of activities or like the type of uh, uh, challenges like further challenges that are being faced by uh, by respondents uh, to put in place those. Um, those uh, those practices, that would be one, in my opinion, that uh, uh, could be quite uh, quite interesting. What do you think about uh, specifically on the ESG? Uh, actually, uh, trying to trying to identify the the actually flow sort of the the composition of flow through on carbon pricing to to end customers and doing that by an industry and and the small business basis. I I think uh, without would that potentially be helpful, getting a better picture of that who's absorbing and who's not. Yeah, like doing a similar analysis than the one that would have been done like on the previous quarter around like the rising cost of inputs and see what measures are actually being put in place to uh, uh, by the businesses to uh, to cope with potential increase in the prices and what is feasible versus what's not. I do believe that this could be quite uh, uh, quite telling and would be data that is actionable. I think that's the uh, the end goal of that uh, uh, of that survey is making sure that the data that we produce and that we obtain is actionable by 
businesses, by economic development agencies, uh, so so that like measures can be taken to uh, um, to uh, to address those topics. Yeah, and I, I think kind of related to that, the other the other question that sort of come up as as we've explored this further is the degree to which some of those supply chain holdups are just about the, the physical supply and the inventories that Stephen put forward and the degree to which there's actually a liquidity issue within certain supply chains, certain verticals. So one of the things I think we want to keep a watch on is whether you know, we talk about the financing, we talk about the supply chain, where does that overlay? And are there things that that can be done by different players around certain verticals to, to, to alleviate some of those supply chain and liquidity issues. The, 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 the one where like where we were doing like a double click on um, by industry supply versus demand related challenges. And you had those four quadrants with different graphs. I think like the, the other angle of analysis and that would need to be done on a longer period of time is are these different level of or types of challenges that businesses face based or like due to the fact that some industries are in different maturity stage as they come out of the pandemic or not. So can we have like, would one indicator be a, uh, an early sign, early warning sign of what might happen in other industries? I think that would be quite telling and would be important to like monitor across time. We have some uh, questions coming in from the audience. Uh, feel free uh, to actually bring them forward yourselves. It's a small group. We can have a, uh, a conversational dialogue. Uh, but um, uh, Leah, do you want to raise your question or would you like me to read it? So uh, my colleague Leah, who is our Senior Director of uh, Workforce Strategies, uh, was just uh, wondering, uh, looking into our into the crystal ball, uh, what sort of trends should we watch for uh, in the Q4 uh, collection or uh, Q4 in the business cycle? Yeah, I think that's a that is a good question there in terms of going forward. Like some of the things we emphasize in this survey, we talked about uh, the pressures on input costs, and so uh, in August we had the CPI reading of 4.1, which is the highest level of overall inflation in Canada. Now there's obviously some effects comparing back to a pandemic when prices were low a year ago. Um, but essentially, you know, how, how much will the input cost pressure result in a prolonging of the overall price pressures that we're seeing in Canada? So the Bank of Canada is hoping and, and expecting that price pressures will be a transitory phenomenon. And so let's say in three to six months, we'll see that um, overall level of, of price increases come down. So I, I would say looking at the input costs in the next quarter of the survey, to see whether they're still at that same level, see if we're seeing some pass through on that. Uh, supply chains have been, again, thought to be a, a temporary disruption. And we talked about semiconductors in, in my part of the talk as well, but um, that's proved to be a bit more persistent uh, in terms of the impacts, a bit more per pervasive than people thought uh, in the manufacturing sector. So I think we, we should be looking back to the same answer to those same questions to see uh, whether things are, are you know, have improved. Uh, and similarly, it's going to be impacted by whether or not, uh, if we can avoid lockdowns, so the, making sure that the vaccine pass, vaccination rates are high, vaccine passports, uh, that we have interoperability across provinces. If people can show something in Ontario, which is accepted in Quebec, uh, that, that will help a lot more with mobility of goods and people. And that would be a good thing. So I think just sort of overall monitoring where we're at in the pandemic, where we're at in the fourth wave, and uh, these supply constraints, whether, whether they have effectively abated a bit more uh, three months out. Thanks. Uh, next question. Do you think companies are overemphasizing on the E and not enough on the S and G? And is that fair to do? I, true that when we look at the at the data, like most of the uh, uh, activities, let's call it like that, or practices that have been undertaken or that are plan that businesses plan to undertake are really on the environmental side of uh, the side of things, like on the social and the governance. There are like uh, um, less uh, uh, practices that have been uh, uh, identified in the um, in the uh, um, in that uh, in that survey survey um, potentially will raise some of those like due to the complexity due to the lack also of frameworks or like standards uh, across the board that uh, uh, that are making those practices uh, uh, largely more complex to uh, to implement 
uh, is that fair to do? I think like uh, uh, our perspective on ESG is that like this is, these are topics that you need to address at once. These are topics that you need to think collectively uh, uh, and not in isolation. Hence why they're most of the time presented like on, uh, uh, with, that, uh, with that acronym. And we would recommend like to, uh, to, 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 to tackle those as part of like the larger corporation plan on those on each one of those topics at, uh, at once. Yeah, I would just underline, I think the, the data piece is difficult on all of those different dimensions to get at. And um, so despite best intentions, a lot of it is just sort of practically sort of figuring out how you're actually making progress. I think on the, the broader ESG portfolio, there's been a lot of views around, there've been a lot of declarations and then how do you actually communicate progress that you're actually making in, uh, in that front? So that that's quite difficult to do. And I think the other thing worth mentioning is that um, some of these things are in general, just difficult issues to address. <laughs> and so the progress, you know, different organizations have different um, assets available to the, to, to, for them to address, but I would say all of them find, find the overall domain challenging to, to address um, to, just because of its, if nothing else, for its newness and its complexity. Uh, another question, labor shortages, skill shortages, employee retention uh, were identified as key supply side obstacles. Are these across all sectors or does it vary by industry? Jean, I think you had a, a chart before on that that looked at the differentiation across sectors and pulls out some of the key ones. Yes, yeah, so so it is, it is across all sectors that uh, that it's being like the uh, those um, demand like supply side. Uh, um, sorry, I'll start again. Like the supply related challenges are faced by all sectors across Canada compared to demand related obstacles. However, there are some nuances by uh, by industry, and if you um, so on the supply side of things, the highest impacted uh, uh, sectors are agriculture, construction, wholesale trade, as well as accommodation and food services, manufacturing and retail trade. So a way to simplify it, like when we were analyzing the data and like extracting the, uh, uh, the, 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 the insights is that most of the industry uh, that are selling goods tend to be uh, more impacted by supply related ch challenges uh, compared to the industry that are vastly selling, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but vastly selling services, uh, they're facing less uh, supply related challenges. And keep in mind that in the supply related challenges, we also included those like, uh, whether it's a rising cost of input, but we also include things like the labor shortage and the uh, ability to recruit and retain uh, skilled labor. Yeah, I think that's right. Like basically if you look around at restaurants, hotels, uh, retail, so there's lots of restrictions on in-person retail, but at the same time, uh, we hear a lot of people just having difficulty being able to, to bring people in to, uh, to work in the stores. So, um, and also a, a differentiation among uh, CMAs, like the big like Toronto, for example, versus um, get, get beyond Peterborough and Prince Edward County or other places, more, more rural um, and remote locations having a lot harder time you know, out east in Atlantic Canada as well. Just difficulty, um, long-standing labor shortage problem, but uh, even more acute now in the pandemic. And I'm, I'm, I'm bringing back up like some of the, uh, if you recall, like for, for those who were like part of the previous release on Q2 2021, um, like your question you ask about the long-term implication. I think the what, what we saw in the previous uh, previous data is that there's a strong positive association between industries that are experiencing rising cost of inputs and the one that also expect the selling price of their products or services to actually increase as well. So it's passed to the end. So that it's, a, it's an early indicator that this is being passed to the end customer at the, uh, at, uh, at the end of the day. And so, like the, the I'm, I'm looking at the, the graph now, but the manufacturing, construction, agriculture, wholesale trade, and accommodation food services were the one that were expecting the highest 
increase of cost like of um, the highest uh, rise of cost of inputs as well as the one that we're planning to increase the price of their services or their goods so that could be the impact like to me in my opinion uh, the impact on the longer term basis that you would see an increase in the price hence why like last time we were having a discussion a bit more around uh, sustained inflation that uh, uh, that could happen as a result of uh, of that Uh, any other uh, geographic discrepancies that we saw? Oh. I think Leah was trying to unmute, but having issues yeah, I uh, think, uh, muting my... yourself to jump in. So. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Are you here? Oh, you're actually here. Hey, okay. great. Welcome. You're live. I, I'm not it, used to these uh, this format. I apologize. Thanks very much. This was very informative, and I usually uh, push in on the labor side of things. But, Stephen, you had just mentioned in the urban you know, the discrepancies between rural, urban and rural in the accommodation and food sectors, for example. I was just wondering if there were any other, you know, sort of geographical or, or jurisdictional uh, discrepancies that, that stuck, out, stuck out to everyone from, from this. Thanks very much. Maybe, Leah, we can, we can flip it back to you just to, to maybe get your sense. So this, this was a survey obviously conducted with 15,000 businesses, but when you talk to the chambers across the country, um, you know, what, what other issues do you think that we should be digging down and, and looking into? Because obviously there's been the rural, urban and labor shortage issue has, has been, you know, a longstanding issue. COVID and the pandemic have, have just exacerbated certain pockets and certain challenges. But, um, you know, what, what, are, what are you hearing or what are you seeing from uh, your interaction with chamber members? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. That's an excellent question as, as well. And what I would say, you know, again, because I focus on on sort of the labor, I think, you know, Maybe geographically, it's it's playing out about by the sectors, but but what is fascinating is how it plays out across the country. And I think, you know, as we delve into this this labor piece a bit more, and and was interesting with our Deloitte colleagues had to say both on you know the capacities and capability side, uh, you know, really digging down into that, trying to understand it, what skills are needed, uh, but but more importantly, what we can do in in that. Um, in that context will be increasingly important. Thanks. The the CSBC hasn't uh, typically sort of probed uh, by Knox codes, uh, occupational codes, but but I wonder if we could make some sort of inference based on the um, the contract work data that we received this time. So the heavily focused on on the text, you know. Um, uh, you know, professional services focus. Uh, with, with that, Leah, is that ringing true as sort of um, uh, uh, a specific occupation that's highly in demand right now, either professional services or ICT? Oh, absolutely. It's a high growth area, especially in, you know, it was pre-pandemic, right? And as we say, this this pandemic's just accelerated so many trends, including that, that you know, uh, digitization, e-commerce, uh, AI. And I think, you know, what we're also trying to track here is, you know, increased automation as, as you know, businesses have to make some choices in, in labor shortages. And if they, they, you know, were on the fence or somewhere around that fence and, and are jumping into increased automation, what that means for skill sets for their workers. Um, Patrick, I think it's an excellent point. Elia, I mean, some of the occupations that I would note, just looking at the, the growth in terms of job postings and vacancies, uh, IT, I, anything IT related, computer co programming, coding, uh, the rest of it, I mean, that's obviously in very high demand and was in high demand more, but that we've seen an acceleration in COVID, but uh, shortages of, of nursing, obviously long-term care was, was an area where people were having a very hard time getting staff. Um, carpenter, so the construction, but carpentry, uh, construction trade laborers, all, all those types of uh, skilled trades have had a very, very hard time uh, bringing people in. And then on the retail uh, retail sales as well, just again, getting people to uh, help out in, in small businesses and storefronts, um, kitchen uh, staff and, and food food service, waiters, uh, those types of things. Those are some of the, the occupations I think where we've seen people uh, may have been out, out, out of labor force, or at least on the sidelines, uh, may or may not have been eligible for CERB and, and other benefits, but um, having some difficulties in some of those sectors, which hopefully will be temporary, but some of the other ones that 
I mentioned more skilled trades have been a long term uh, on the on the healthcare side, you know, nursing and and those types of fields where we definitely just need to graduate more people and uh, and admit more into the field. Yeah, and Stephen, what'll be great is if we, you know, can work more along, you know, sort of entry level positions and then you know step ladders up. But the other piece that'll be interesting is in the tech fields, right? The niche, you know, the niche tech, but how it will affect you know jobs across the board. Right. You know, we talked a lot, I think durable or human skills are very important, but this whole, you know, sort of tech, you know, tech savvy milieu is going to be uh, important for all of us, regardless of um, of our actual profession. It's going to reach across them. It, it'll be an interesting trend to watch as well. Thanks. So with that, uh, last chance for questions or, or to explore an idea that uh, we may have. I think everyone now has the ability to unmute themselves. So just go ahead and jump in. No? Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us for release of this quarter's uh, Business Insights. I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, of your busy schedules uh, to join us to explore these important issues. Uh, I want to thank Stephen, Will, Jean uh, for uh, presenting uh, presenting the insights to us today and exploring what they mean. Uh, the Canadian Chamber will be back doing this again uh, before the end of the year with uh, a fourth quarter insights. Um, everything that uh, was discussed and presented today will be online on, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, sent through our uh, uh, communications to our members. So you will have the charts in hand. They're also on chamber.ca. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to reach out to either myself or Stephen. Uh, we're always happy to chat. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>